Hey guys, we're gonna get going in a in a minute here. If if I could just have everybody throw their hands up just to let me know that you guys can hear me okay. Uh go ahead and do that now. Yeah, I see a, uh, a bunch more people are joining here. We'll get going in a minute. Um, just doing another sound check. Go ahead and throw a hand up if you can hear me okay. Awesome. Looks like a lot of you guys can hear me. Just going to give everybody another minute. Okay, one more quick time before we get going. Go ahead and throw a hand up. Just let me know that you can hear me okay. Okay, awesome. Looks like uh, for the most part, everybody can see and hear me okay. Still see people joining in chunks here, so I'm just going to uh, hold off one more minute. For those of you guys joining, if you can hear me okay, go ahead and throw a hand up. Awesome. Okay. Uh, it looks like I got uh, a hand from pretty much... Uh, everybody, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Locked In Learning Series, Visologic Communications. Okay, so up to this point, we have covered hardware and software, ladder, HMI in memory, data logging, and this week we are going over communications. Zach, great job on Tuesday with Unilogic. Today we are going to go over Visilogic and some of the options that we have for connection and communication. I want uh, everybody also to stay tuned uh, in the upcoming weeks. I'm not going to give away any surprises, but be aware of some webinars that will be held um, next week and throughout the next coming weeks. Okay, so let's dive into communications. First, we're going to take a look at physical layers. Now, what I mean by physical layers is your physical means of connecting one device to another or connecting within a network of devices. Some of the physical layers that we're going to cover today are serial, CAN bus, and Ethernet. Serial. Uh, a lot of you guys may be familiar with serial communication and have heard of RS-232 or 485, specifically when connecting to your unit to download or use online mode. RS-232 connection is going to be a one-to-one -one connection between devices that need to communicate. RS-485 is going to let you introduce nodes into a network for communication. Now, it's not to say that you need multiple devices. You could have one-to-one -one communication, but with RS-485, you need to account for termination. So if you have more than one device on a network, the end devices need to have a terminating resistor, which allows the line to know that the message is ending at that particular point. If you do not set termination, uh, you could introduce noise issues into the system. 
If you're using 485 as a one-to-one -one connection, because you still have a small network, both of those end nodes, both devices in this case, are both gonna have termination set. Now, serial communication is half duplex. What I mean by half duplex is one device is going to be talking while the other device is listening. If you have both devices talking at the same time, uh, there will be conflict on the line and communication will not be as uh, feasible as it seems, whereas half duplex, one uh, one device is listening, one device is talking, so you have one device um, send communication, the other device receives it. Now with serial, um, I'm sure that you guys have seen in testing and in applications, shorter runs are necessary, 232 even shorter, right? And the reason for this is because you have a uh, connection that it is it is not as uh, it, it fairly I, I should say they're fairly susceptible to to noise. And what I mean by that is is the longer the run of the cable, um, the more potential there is for interference on the line. So it is not as robust of a connection as CAN bus or Ethernet would be. Which is going to bring us to our next physical layer, CAN bus. Uh, you can see right off the bat, just from the picture on this slide, the CAN bus cable is very heavy duty, right? You have a number of different wires there, and and you, you'll see that um, not only are they uh, twisted and shielded, but very well protected. Uh, and one also, uh, another thing to point out is you do have power running through the line. Now, my first point under CAN bus is device net. I want to point out that we do not support device net protocol. But the CAN bus cabling uh, in a lot of scenarios are going to, uh, we would recommend using device net cable. Um, that device net cable is, is very similar to what you see here in this picture. Uh, it's going to be very, very well protected from noise and is going to allow communication to be very, very fast. Um, now, uh, along with speed, right, or, or a very quick means of communication, you can have devices a lot farther away than you would be able to with like an RS-45 network. Uh, you actually can have devices up to a kilometer away from each other while still maintaining um, a very robust means of connection and communication over CAN bus. Last but not least, uh, one that you guys might be most familiar with, whether it be in the field or outside of the field, uh, is Ethernet, right? Ethernet is, is everywhere these days. Uh, it's a very versatile means of connection. You have a lot of different capabilities over Ethernet, and that might be from connecting with VisiLogic to a PLC or playing Xbox or PS4 uh, online with people around the world, right? So you have the means to communicate with uh, a lot of different people, and in this case, devices, um, that might be spread out throughout the universe. This is going to require some form of networking, right? A lot of times IT gets brought into setting up Ethernet communications, uh, and they can help when you have cases where you might want to reach uh, a device that is very far away or off-site. Right, uh, especially in these times, right, with COVID, um, you might have a situation where you can't get on site to maybe troubleshoot a unit or see what's happening uh, in runtime of a of a process. And this is where networking is very very valuable to give you remote access into one of those units that you cannot physically be at the face of. Um, and in order to get access, right, a lot of different IP schemes are going to be needed, right? So today we're going to discuss local area networking specifically uh, and also just introduce how to maybe connect uh, remotely through port forwarding. Now, guys, uh, in real time, if you guys want to enter your questions into the questions box, I'm going to be hanging out here for... Uh, a little bit afterwards. So feel free as questions pop up, you don't have to wait till the end, go ahead and throw those into the question box uh, at any time. Okay, now we've discussed physical layers or your physical means of connecting different devices. Now, once you have a physical connection, you then need a way to communicate over that physical layer. Think of a phone call, right? So if let's just say uh, Zach who presented 
um, the Unilogic presentation on Tuesday, if I call Zach on the phone, that's our physical means of connecting. Now, if I go and try to speak English and Zach only understands French or Spanish, we're going to have some difficulty in communication. If I speak Spanish and Zach speaks Spanish, that is a common denominator for how we can communicate. So devices on a particular network or in different forms of physical connection need to have a protocol that matches in order for communication to be successful. I just want to touch on some serial CAN bus and Ethernet protocols that you have the ability to use in a VisiLogic or vision-based application. Let's start with serial. The first point that I have here is PCOM in online mode. Now, what I mean by PCOM is your means of communication through VisiLogic to a particular controller. Uh, a lot of times, if you just go out to the field, connect to a unit, uh, maybe use online mode or download or perform an upload, uh, you might not even know that you're using PCOM protocol. And what that is, is allowing you to connect with the software to use the utilities that are built into VisiLogic. Now, another very, um, I'd say, industry wide protocol uh one that i definitely come across uh the the most i'd say uh is modbus now modbus is going to allow you to set up master and slave or field definitions and it is going to allow a device to pull a second device in order to either send information to or pull information from uh, I also have slash VFD up there. Modbus is going to be your means of communicating to a Unitronics VFD. Um, so Modbus is uh, very useful depending on the application, whether it be a third-party device or another Unitronics device or VFD. Function block protocol can also be thought of as open protocol. Now, what I mean by open protocol is if you have a device that let's just say maybe sends raw commands. Think of like a barcode reader. Um, if we want to scan a barcode and accept um, that string of characters, we actually have the ability to teach the PLC that we are using a particular language to communicate. So we can expect what information to come in and information to come out. So let's just say if you have a situation where you might have an ASCII printer or um, again, a barcode reader, if you're sending or receiving information that might just be a raw string of data, function block protocol is very, very useful. There are also a number of free hyper terminals available on the web um, that will allow you to troubleshoot an application if you can't seem to get um, uh, variables down or if you think information is right but you, you, you're not seeing anything pop up, hyperterminals are, are very useful to show you what the true message is so you can um, make sure that the structure is right in the software. And last but not least I have modem up there uh, and the reason why I have modem um, is we have a serial 3G modem kit that will allow you to be able to send and receive texts uh, on Vision Series controllers and Sambas. Um, if we have a minute uh, during this presentation um, or this demo, uh, I will pull up an example. If not, uh, if we don't get to it, that's that's fine. Um, I can always discuss. If you guys have questions, just throw questions in the in the question box at any time. Next, we have CAN bus. Uh, I'm going to start off with UniCAN. What UniCAN is is a CAN bus based protocol that is a Unitronics protocol that allows you to communicate with remote IO or other Unitronics uh, controllers. So the most common case you would use UniCAN is if you have an EXRC1 in an application, um, that is gonna be your means of communication from your PLC or the head unit to that remote IO station. Next you have CAN Open. CAN Open, um, I would say is the CAN bus protocol that I would come across the most, uh, of course, besides UniCAN. CAN Open allows you to communicate with um, drives and encoders. I also have slash servo here uh, because this would be your means of communicating with our servo motor. 
and I'll show you how to introduce one of those into the software once we get into it. Next, we have CAN Layer 2 and J1939. One note on J1939, it is an automotive protocol that is not supported by the Unistream series. So if you have an application that pops up where you have uh, some sort of application where you might have the unit on uh, like a fracking truck or something like that, um, J1939 protocol is typically used on vehicle applications so you we would if you called in just for some product recommendations we would be driving you in the direction of something that you can program in Visilogic just because you inherently don't have it available uh, in Unilogic and again last but not least possibly the most important Ethernet right Ethernet is going to give you um, a lot of different Applic uh, or I'm sorry, different protocols, right? Modbus and function block protocol, uh, you actually can do over uh, Ethernet as well as serial. Uh, Ethernet-based communication is also going to give you the ability for remote access and emailing. Um, so if you want to get to a unit either that is on-site or maybe off-site, you're going to have to set up a little bit of port forwarding. Um, but essentially what you're going to do is you are going to uh, point in the direction of the local, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to point in the direction of the global IP address or public IP address. Uh, and what port forwarding is going to do is it is going to direct traffic to your internal local area network. So you essentially want to point to the router that you want to get to. And then port forwarding is going to direct traffic to the actual unit that you want to get to on the local area network. Now, uh, for those of you guys who, for those of you guys who know what port forwarding, and port forwarding is and have done it before, great. If not, um, if if anybody has set up any sort of uh, gaming server or, so, or some sort of um, means to play maybe xbox or ps4 online that is uh port, that has an aspect of port forwarding that you might have performed already and, and and not even known it so uh remote access over ethernet is very very valuable again especially in times like this this is going to be your means of uh communicating with a unit that could potentially be local or anywhere in the world Okay, so uh, what we are going to do today, uh, protocol-wise, um, we're going to do a demonstration, uh, and what that demonstration, is, or what that demonstration is going to uh, hopefully achieve, is show you how to initialize COM ports. I want to show you how to connect over Ethernet. And I'm also going to show you some tips and tools that you have for troubleshooting when you have an Ethernet-based application. So that project that we build for Ethernet communication is absolutely going to be available. I'm then going to run through a series of examples that are pre-built. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to include these uh, in any, if you guys need it at all, I can absolutely send it to you. Um, all the applications that we cover today are going to be built in examples in the help file. So these would be accessible at any time. Uh, if you just go to help, examples and then the communications folder um, but what we're going to do is specifically take a look at emailing a serial modbus example a can open example and a function block protocol example and last but not least we're going to end with some questions uh, again at any time feel free to throw a question in the questions box and we'll get to it at the end uh, if we do not get a chance to cover anything that you might want to take a look at today, or if we run out of time, feel free to email support with any questions. Um, if you have a particular protocol that is coming up in an application that you might be working on and have some questions about it, or just how to how to go about constructing it in, in logic or how to reference different uh, elements on the HMI, go ahead and shoot us an email. Let us know what you got going on, and we'd be, we'd be happy to help and, and take a look at, at anything that you might have happening. All right, uh, I appreciate you sitting through a boring slideshow presentation. Now let's get into some fun stuff. I'm gonna go to the software. And when I start a new project, today I'm working with a V570 that has serial capability and ethernet capabilities. 
I, I do not have a hardware configuration, so I'm going to leave this blank. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Now, a lot of what we take a look at today, I mean, for the most part, is really going to be ladder and uh, memory map based. So I'm not going to focus too much on the HMI. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the main routine. And I want to start out by showing you the COM drop-down menu. Now, when you have any sort of uh, communication or connection in your application, typically you are going to use function blocks or elements that are listed in the COM drop-down menu. So if I navigate to COM, you'll see some options like COM port, TCP IP, set PLC name, You'll also see some different protocols that I mentioned in the in the presentation. Unican, can open and servo, can layer two, J1939, and send email. In combination with setting up your comm channels, you'll also have a function block list. Uh, let's just say if you wanted to communicate Modbus or function block protocol, you'll see that you have your function blocks in these menus here. I'm going to go to comm. I'm going to hover over COM port and I'm going to grab a COM initialization block. Now, just a quick note, you would never have a COM initialization block directly on the rail. What that would do is try to initialize communication or the COM port that you are trying to set up for communication every scan, which means that it would never truly be ready to communicate to a device. So typically you would want this based off some condition most likely SB2, which is your power up bit. So the second the controller comes on, it's ready to communicate over the port that you're trying to configure. Now in your COM port dropdown, you'll have a number of serial ports, right? So physical COM1, physical COM2. Uh, if you have a 570, 1040, or 1210 and want to add a third COM port to it, uh, you have COM3. You then have a number of CAN-related options. So you, you can use this menu to initialize a serial port or a CAN bus port. Now, depending on what the communication calls for, you're also going to have a baud rate, which is your communication rate. Typically in serial communication, if you have two devices, um, both of those are going to have to support the same baud rate in order to communicate successfully. So in, uh, let's just say if I have one Samba controller trying to communicate with another Samba controller, um, we support a wide number of baud rates. You typically want to use the max baud rate here. That's going to be the fastest means of communication. The farther away the devices get, um, the lower you want to make the baud rate. So when you have two close devices that are communicating over serial, um, if any of you guys have been to one of our trainings, we always do a Modbus example on the third day. Um, you would typically see us using the max baud rate of 115, 200. Let's just say if you had uh, maybe a controller and a third party VFD and the VFD was fairly far away, you might have to communicate at 9600. Now, also depending on the device, you're going to have a number of data bits, parity, and stop bits that you have to make sure match up with the device you're communicating with. And then also the standard RS-232 or 485 if you are choosing a serial port to configure. Now, in combination with the software setting for standard, you also have to account for jumpers on the controller. So if you have a controller that has a port that is RS-232 or 485, you're going to have jumper settings that determine RS-232 or 485, and then if 485, termination or not depending on where it is in the network. So again, if it's an end device, you need to have termination set. Now, if you add a modem, here is where you would choose the type of modem, and then you can choose the actual modem model that you have. The 3G kit is the Centurion EHS6T, so you would choose this guy, uh, and you would set it up in modem services, and then be able to communicate via SMS. Okay, so that is if you are setting up serial communication. The demo that I want to show you guys, I think that this is a very, very valuable uh, example, is I want to show you how to communicate with a unit over Ethernet that is on a local area network, potentially 
um, let's just say if you're on a plant floor, if you want to have a couple of different devices be able to communicate over Ethernet, you have to make sure that they're on the same local area network. And I'm going to show you how to set up a one-to-one -one connection between my V570 and the PC that I'm using. Let's get into the ladder that is typically needed when you have an application that requires Ethernet connectivity. Like I said, a lot of times when you are going to set up initialization for communication, you want that done on the power up bit. So the very first scan of the controller, all of the settings that you need basically get written to the controller. So I'm going to take a direct contact of SB2. And again, I can use a direct contact in this case, and that's because SB2 is only going to go high one time, and that is uh, on the very first scan of the controller. So if I use a direct contact or a positive transition contact um, at the controller level, both of those are going to do the same exact thing. Next, what I'm going to use is under the COM drop-down menu, a set PLC name block. The reason why I want a set PLC name block is this is almost going to act as, uh, you can think of like the password for Ethernet connectivity. You can have the IP address, you can have the port settings. If you do not have the PLC name, it is not going to allow you to connect in the software. Now, with that being said, you don't need to know, uh, it, it's not, mandatory that you remember it, right? You can always go into info mode of the controller and find it in the uh, version software menu. But if you have an application, let's just say um, in a high security area, the info mode password might not be known. Um, so it is very valuable to know the PLC name when you go to connect to a unit. So I'm gonna take a PLC name block. I'm gonna put it right in series with SB2. I'm gonna call this V570 and be sure that you know uh, case sensitivity, right? So if I have lowercase V570, that would mean that the password I'm air quoting is wrong for connection. I need to know that it's capital V570. Now, before I go any further, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into the help file. I'm gonna to go to help. I'm gonna type in ethernet. If I go down to using Ethernet, what I want to do is I want to introduce this diagram. Now, when you have an Ethernet port installed on your controller, you may see one physical connection, but you actually have the ability to do four simulta excuse me, simultaneous things with one connection point. What I mean by that is over one Ethernet cable, you have the ability to maybe communicate with a field device with Modbus, host a web server, have one uh, socket available for a user to communicate with Visilogic, and then maybe also have uh, a socket that's designated to send an email at the end of every day to the foreman and maybe a number of selected users. So Ethernet is very valuable because it allows you to do um, four things simultaneously. Now this is this diagram can be used for every single Vision and Samba series controller aside from the V700. The V700 is a little bit different of an animal. That's going to come with a built-in Ethernet port that allows eight sockets. So if you have an Ethernet heavy application where you might think that having more sockets is uh, valuable, the V700 is what you'd want to go with. Now, with that being said, you can always close a socket and reopen it for a different means of communication. So uh, just going back to the slideshow presentation, that is what I mean by uh, versatility. You have a lot of different capabilities at one time with Ethernet. So I just want to point out real quick, socket zero, socket one, socket two, socket three are your four potential sockets. Um, each socket has a default port. Right, so when you have a socket, you're gonna have uh, a protocol associated with it, a port number associated with it, and if it is a client or server, and we'll get into what I mean by client and server in a minute when we jump back to the software. So if you guys have any questions about this diagram, throw it right in the questions box. I just wanted to bring this up 
Um, so when I start to talk about socket initializations, uh, it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so when I go to COM again, I have TCP IP, and you'll see that I have a card init block and a socket init block. The card init block, I'm going to drop first. This is how we set the IP address for the controller that we're ultimately going to be downloading to. If I click IP address, this is going to give me the, the local IP address of the unit that I would like to connect to. So this is going to be the IP address that I point to when I'm on the same local area network and maybe want to um, connect to it with VisiLogic or if I want to communicate with Modbus, this is the IP address I'm going to point to. So I'm going to put it on my local area network, 102290. Uh, and I'll show you how to put the PC on the same network in a second. So I'll hit OK. Now I need a subnet mask, which in a lot of cases is just going to be 255, 255, 255, That's going to tell me that this last octet is the octet that I, uh, that's going to make the node its own independent address on the network. I'm then going to have a default gateway. Now what my default gateway is my access point to the internet. If I'm connected to a router, my default gateway is going to be the local IP of the router that I'm connected to. So the router that I'm connected to in theory would be two, uh, I'm sorry, 122254. That's the local area network side of the router. The global or wide area network address is going to be your public address that you would that you would most likely be, be paying for. I'm gonna press okay. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up my socket. So if I go back under COM, TCP IP and take a socket init block, if I drop this right in series, I have the ability to choose the socket that I would like to configure, right? Socket one, again, was set by default for port 20256 for VisiLogic communication. So I'm gonna choose socket one. I'm going to make my protocol TCP. I'm just going to pause here real quick. If I was setting up a web server, I would have HTTP. And if I needed a different protocol, I could choose it based on what I need. I'm going to choose TCP. And my local port, I'm just going to use the default 20256. I can use these socket init blocks to change the default settings based on what is going to happen in the application. This is just a very simple example to show how to connect over ethernet. And then I need client or server. Depending on your application, if your controller is reaching out and initiating the handshake with the ethernet based device that you're connecting to, you need to be set up as a client or master. That's gonna give you the capability to initiate the handshake. If we are sitting in the field waiting to get connected to by a client, I'm gonna to have to set up this socket as a server or slave. So this is not going to allow me to reach out and initiate the handshake. I have to wait for the client to reach out and initiate the handshake with me. Once the handshake is initiated, we can pass information back and forth. If that connection is broken, the client must re-reach out back to the server. You cannot reach out as the server to the client if communication is broken. So I'm going to set this as a server because I want to use VisiLogic to make the call to the PLC. Now, just to save time, I have already downloaded this project to the controller. So we know what our settings are now. In the previous weeks for the Locked In Learning series, I have been using this V570 and downloading over Ethernet, and I know that it's almost been, there's almost been an aspect of magic, um, just because uh, you guys basically had to trust me what the IP address and stuff was. Now, if I wanna reach out and make a call to the PLC, I have the option in connection type to choose TCP IP call. That is going to make me the client and I'm gonna reach out to the unit as the server. Now I need to make sure that I'm on the same local area network. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and open my network and sharing center. I'm gonna choose change adapter options. And you'll see that I have a number of different network connections here. In order to guarantee that I'm setting up the right connection, I have my unit plugged into um, 
an Ethernet cable that is plugged into my PC. I just unplug from my PC side, and you'll see that the X pops up. And when I plug back in, the connection uh, point updates from the red X to a little uh, plug emblem. So I'm going to right click on Ethernet. I'm going to choose properties. I'm going to scroll down to Internet Protocol version 4. So you have a version 4 address and a 6 address. Make sure that you're in 4 address. Go ahead and choose Properties. And you'll see that I've, I'm using the following IP. So I'm not randomly getting assigned an IP address. I want to use a static IP address to guarantee that I'm on the same local area network as the unit. The unit was 10.2.2.90. My PC is 10.2.2.95. So if I OK and come back to the software, what I can then do is put in the parameters for connection. I need the IP address. Now remember, once we have the IP address, this is going to allow us to be able to communicate. I can either choose from the project. So I've already used the TCP IP card and NIP block. Once I have one of those in the project, it allows me to reference that IP address, or I could put in, if let's just say I'm connecting to a random unit and I know what the settings are, I can also plug in the IP address here. I'm gonna choose the one from the project. The protocol set up in that socket block was TCP. The port number was 20256. I know the PLC name is capital V570. If I hit okay and choose get OPLC information, you'll see that it gets returned. If I had lowercase v570, you'll see that it is uh, unable to get connection due to an incorrect PLC name. So the ping still happens very fast, but it tells you that you don't have access because the PLC name is not correct. So it's very, very important to keep in mind that you know what the PLC name is. Now, if you don't use a PLC name function block, every unit, no matter what, if it has an Ethernet port, you always have a PLC name assigned to it, and you can find it in info mode, version, software. If you have not given it a name with this function block, it is most likely going to be assigned uh, a random number as the PLC name. So if you guys remember back the last couple of weeks, I was just using that random number, but now that I have an actual project where I'm assigning the PLC name, I have the ability to reference that name. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this for you guys. Um, I'll have this available if anybody needs it. Call this Ethernet Connect. So if anybody wants that or needs that, uh, we'll, we should be posted on the website or you can just shoot me an email, I'll send it over to you. All right. So, uh, that is all I really wanted to demo today. Um, one more thing that uh, I just want to introduce an element of troubleshooting if you ever have issues with Ethernet. Uh, now that we have a successful ping to the controller, I'm going to go online. Now, in the system bits list, If I scroll down to 140, you'll see starting at 140, there is a number of system bits related to the Ethernet card and the sockets that are part of that Ethernet card. You'll see that I have a system bit for the Ethernet card exists and it's initialized. If you have any issues related to Ethernet, it is very important to check these system bits. What these are going to do are allow you to make sure that you have um, all of your ducks in a row, essentially, when it comes to connection, right? So the system bit for the card and the and the um, the card existing and being initialized is very important. You're then going to have bits for each socket being initialized and which ones are currently connected. Since I'm online with the controller. I pointed to socket one. 
for my connection. You'll see that the socket one connected bit is high currently, and none of the other ones are high. That's because I don't have any other connections on my card currently. It's just that socket one connection. So those are some um, very useful system bits that uh, can be used in a project or just as a reference point when you are just checking communication uh, from the very beginning. Okay, so that's all I wanted to demo today. What I'm going to do now is jump into a number of examples uh, that will highlight some aspects of communication and also some function blocks that can be used. Again, right now, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and throw them in that questions box and we'll get to them in about 20 minutes. I'm gonna close out of here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up an example that highlights how to send an email over ethernet. So now that we have a little bit of background on ethernet, I think that this example might make a little more sense. You're gonna see some function blocks that you definitely recognize. If I go to the main routine, you will see the very first net of this project is the same exact net in a little bit different of an order, but that's fine because off of SB2, everything that happens in that net takes place in the, within that first scan. So the order isn't super important, it's just making sure which uh, blocks you actually have there. Now the first point I wanna make is in this socket init block, if I open up the socket init, you'll see that for client and server, this socket is set to be a client. And the reason for that is when we're sending an email over ethernet, we have to reach out to that email server and make a connection first before we send an email. Um, these two first nets of this project uh, are going to be um, used widely throughout Ethernet-based applications where we are going to initiate communication, right? So you can think of it, even if it's not reaching out to an email server to send an email, if you're reaching out to a robot to send ASCII commands, if you're reaching out to uh, a Modbus field device, um, you could use this connect block to access the remote IP and the remote port of the device or server you are connecting to. Now, one thing to mention, uh, very it's a, it's a very important thing to mention, when you are sending email in VisiLogic or with a Vision or Samba series controller, you must use a non-encrypted server. So that, does, that means that you're not gonna be able to use Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, um, you have to make sure that you have a non-SSL encrypted server. Now, if you guys need any sort of suggestions on what to use, you can shoot us an email. Me personally, I have had a lot of success with MailJet. Uh, MailJet is a good non-encrypted email um, uh, server to use. If you wanted to use something that you're more familiar with, great. If you have maybe like a work account where you can toggle encryption, um, that would work as well, but you definitely cannot use SSL encrypted or else you're going to start to get some weird uh, activity when you try to send an email. Now, the actual send email block is in the com send email. You will see that you're going to need a from, a to, any CC or BCC, a subject, any attachments from the SD card, Right, so you can actually choose an attachment from an SD folder, choose the file name, and you can send that along with the email. If you have any sort of event logs or something like that, that you wanna send to a number of users, maybe at the end of the day or the end of the week, you can do this with an email. You then can have a body, right? So you can have direct mail content where I can just simply type uh, an email body out. I also can have indirect mail content. If I wanted to, let's just say, send zone temperatures or something like that, that might be updating. I have the ability to do that as well. And then I have status messages. So the status message is very important. Uh, when you are sending an email, you always want to uh, verify what that status is. If you're not sending successfully, that message can be very helpful when troubleshooting. And last but not least, we have a close block. So in the COM drop-down menu, 
In TCP IP, we have connect and close. The connect block I had already showed, the close block is going to close the socket connection. Um, it's very important in applications where if you know that a disconnect is going to be happening at some point, um, you want to make sure that you have the ability to control that disconnect. So that closed socket block is going to close the socket for you. Um, and then when you want to reconnect, you just go ahead and trigger that sequence that has um, the connect block. Okay, so any questions on email, go ahead and throw in the questions box. I'm going to now move on to a serial Modbus example. Now this is if we are a master or the one initiating the commands, the slave or field device is never going to have any command blocks. Um, it is simply just going to have a scan block that is going to look for incoming commands and I'll highlight that in a second here. So, serial Modbus, two most important function blocks on PowerUp are the common it block, this is choosing the physical COM port that you're communicating over, the baud rate, the data bits, parity, and stop bits, and also standard at what you're using. So you have the ability to communicate Modbus serially and over Ethernet. If you're doing it serially, you can, you can send commands over 232 and 45. I'm gonna hit okay. I'm then gonna have a Modbus configuration block. Modbus configuration block is going to be the port at which I'm communicating Modbus on. My network ID, right? So when I use serial Modbus, it's not IP addressing. I need a physical ID number that lets me know which node I am on the network. So if I had a master as ID two, I could have a field device that is any other ID aside from two. One, for example. And then have timeout, number of retries, and a function in progress bit. Now, once I'm configured to communicate Modbus in my function blocks list, I have a number of utilities that I have available to me. I can scan for incoming commands if I'm the slave, right? So this is where your slave uh, function blocks come into play, scan EX, so you'll still have a configuration and then a scan block. If I'm acting as a master, I have a number of different read and write commands based on what I'm trying to do. If I am simply trying to just read a register from a slave device, what I need to do, or a field device, what I need to do is I need to reference slave addressing that will come with the model of device that I am trying to communicate with. If you are trying to communicate with a Unitronics PLC, the slave address table can be found in help. If you navigate to Modbus, you'll have a link for slave address tables. Depending on the vision series controller you're using, you're going to have the slave address tables in this list. So you'll see that if I'm trying to maybe get a value, if I'm, let's just say, if I have a V570 communicating with another V570, if I want to access MIs, I have a pointer value at which the MIs start at in hex. So what I would do is I would convert this pointer value to decimal and then simply add the address as the offset. So point of value from zero hex for an MI, I convert that to zero decimal. If I want to read MI3, my slave address is three. If I want to read MI15, my slave address is 15 and so on. So you'll see here, for my Modbus, my Modbus read holding registers, if I'm just trying to read an MI from a different uh, vision series controller, for example, I have my slave ID, ID one, right? So it can't be two because my master is two. So I have a different ID for my field device. In this case, it is one. The slave start of vector is the slave address of the slave device that you are trying to reach a particular point at. So if I'm trying to reach MI 101 on a slave, 
my slave address is simply 101. Now, because it is slave start of vector, I have a length or read length for the vector that I want to pull from that slave controller. So if I want to pull 10 values, my read vector length is 10. If I want to pull one, it would be one. And the master start of vector is where that information is coming to on my controller. So you'll see you're going to have a memory location. You then have status messages, number of sessions, and number of acknowledgments. Sessions are going to be the number of total tries for that read command. Acknowledgments are going to be the number of successful pingbacks you get from the slave. So in theory, you would always want total sessions to match acknowledgments. Okay, so that's a crash course on Modbus. I'm going to move on again. If you guys have any uh, specific questions, either shoot it into the question box or send us an email. I just I know that we're up against the clock right now, so I'm just going to move on to our can open example. Again, all of these projects are in help examples, version 900, project examples, communication. Okay, in our can open example, very similar uh, to our previous examples, you, you have a net at the top that is going to do all of your initialization for you. In this particular project, we have one that sets our ID, our Canvas ID. We then determine which port we're using. We're using the Canvas port for can open and servo configuration with a baud rate of one megabyte. You then have a can open configuration function block. Now, what this uh, example is actually doing is communicating with a can open encoder that is going to be ID2 on our network. If we wanted to set up more, I can enable these network IDs to act as can open devices. If I wanted to initiate them to be a slave, what I can, I'm sorry, a, a uh, servo on a can open network, what I can do is I can right click on the node ID that I would like, and choose can open servo. I have the ability to add up to three servos in a Visilogic project. So depending on what your uh, can open device is acting as, whether it be third party can open device or a Unitronic servo, this is the menu that you are configuring in. Now for a can open node, you're gonna have an enable bit you're then going to have the ability to set up your process data objects. So depending on what you are trying to pull or send in real time to that can open device, this is where you would set up your process data objects, right? So let's just say if you're just trying to get a number of pulses or speed or something like that uh, from your device, this is where you have your menu to do so. You also have the ability to program service data objects. Uh, now the difference between those service data objects, um, in a lot of cases where you have uh, can open communication, um, this is going to allow you to configure settings on the can open device you're communicating with. One of the things that I come across a good amount uh, is an SDO that you have to send to the can open device, like let's just say the encoder or the motor, that enables the heartbeat or enables the PDOs to be active. So um, you have to make sure in a lot of cases that you have your ducks in a row so that you are communicating with a device that is not only enabled on our side, but enabled on its side as well. You are not expected um, to have to manually read an EDS file or an electronic data sheet that comes with a can open device. Uh, under tools, if you go to uni EDS CO, you can load the EDS file into this reader and it will actually read it for you. So you'll have all of the different points 
available with this device. So that's very helpful when it comes to uh, setting up the, the comms for the particular encoder or motor or device. Okay, last but not least, I'm gonna move on to function block protocol. And I'm gonna show you guys how in theory you would be able to receive a barcode from a barcode reader. So first thing uh, is very similar to your other examples that we, uh, or our other examples that we've looked at previously. We have a common it block. Since we're communicating 232 at 9600 to this barcode reader, I then need a protocol configuration function block. If I go to function blocks, protocol, I have a config block. What that config block allows me to do is determine the protocol on the particular physical port. It's then going to allow me to determine a function in progress bit and a status message. So if a function in progress bit, we saw this with Modbus as well. If a function in progress is, uh, or if a function is in progress, MB0 will be high, or any arbitrary MB that you that you decide to use from the memory map. You can use this as preconditions to different um, nets in the ladder, right? So if if a function in, is in progress and you don't want to be able to scan, uh, you can use that accordingly in your project. And then a status that is going to help if you have any uh, any misreads or failures. Now. Last but not least in net one is we're actually setting a receive ready bit and that is going to run our scan block. When we have a scan block, that means we are expecting information to be coming in. We have a send block, that means we have information going out. So in our scan block, this is where we configure our variable or barcode, or if we're, let's just say, communicating ASCII commands with a robot or some sort of third-party device um, function block protocol can be very useful for information coming in in um, not mainstream ways if you will right so if you have a device that maybe doesn't support modbus or can't open but you do have the ability to send it raw and receive raw information function block protocol can be very useful so you basically set up all of your variables in this list they can be hard coded or they can be indirect, right? So if I have, let's just say a number of valid part numbers, let's just say if I have a, a production line um, where parts are gonna come by, if I wanna scan those codes, if I have four valid parts that I know that I'm making, I can hard code those four. And then my last could be a variable that could hold any random barcode, right? That might deem it invalid. So if I don't have any matches in the first four, right? So I scan, what the controller does is it, is it checks this list for any matches. Uh, and if it does not match, um, I can use that index number that comes in in order to tell me if I have a valid part or a non-valid part. Now, one thing that I wanna mention when it comes to uh, function block protocol, it is normally ASCII protocol. So you have the ability to determine what the start of text of a message is. Let's just say in any valid barcode, if it starts with like a number one or a letter A, um, I can use that as a start of text and that determines if uh, right off the bat, if it's valid or not. I can also use terminators. I can have an end of text character. Let's just say if I know that every barcode ends with a five or a B, I could have that determine the end of text. So that determines the end of the string that is being read in. I also can use a message length. If I know that every valid barcode coming in is 19 characters, I can use that message length to determine the end of the string. My, my personal favorite is silence, right? If I am scanning a barcode if i see silence for a certain amount of time that determines that it is the end of the string so you can almost think of the controller as um as a as a or, or in this case right think of it as a brick where it does not have the smarts to determine what the end of a string is you have to have some sort of terminator that lets the controller know that hey that barcode is done being read so that's a quick crash course on protocols. 
Um, that's all I have for examples and demos for you guys today. I really, really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I know that, I mean, for me, this week's been pretty busy, so I can assume that it's been pretty busy for you guys. So uh, I'm going to take some questions. If you guys have a minute to stick around, great. Uh, if not, this is all the material that I have for you this week. Feel free to check in um, in a couple of days for the recording. And if you guys want any of these examples, feel free to take a look in uh, the help file or shoot me an email and I can, I can send them over to you. So let's take a look at some questions. Okay, uh, first question, how to simulate PLC ladder uh, without Ethernet and USB ports? So we don't have any simulation software, unfortunately. What you are going to need to do uh, is download physically to the controller and use online mode and remote access in order to view the ladder in the screen. Half duplex, is that half the fun? I would definitely say so. Um, it's very nice in um, Ethernet. That, that I, I know that that was <laughs> more, more of a comment than, than anything, but um, what's uh, one thing that I actually failed to mention in the slideshow is serial communication is, is half duplex, right? So you have one master, one slave. Uh, the master sends the commands while the slave listens. Um, in an Ethernet-based application, you can actually have a multi-master. You can set up two different sockets um, to be a master and a slave, right, and vice versa on the other device, right? So you can actually have um, both devices act as a quasi-master, which might be uh, helpful in, in some cases. How do I connect a printer to a PLC? Great question. Uh, in a lot of cases, you are going to send commands to an ASCII printer and you would use function block protocol. So based on what the, what the printer is expecting to see slash print, you would send that via function block protocol to the printer and then the printer would do the, the work from there. So that's a great question. That is actually a really good um, case for like real life case for function block protocol we actually have an example in the examples list if you want to take a look at that one specifically uh, in modbus protocol can you use both rtu and tcp or are you limited to one or the other great question if you have both a serial port and an ethernet port they can act independent of one another so that is your other means of getting around half duplex if you will how can I send email through PLC? If you want to just take a look at that example that I went over, most important thing to remember is the email server being non-encrypted. So I'm going to use this time just to say this again. Uh, you will not be able to send an email with a Gmail account, for example. Uh, you can, however, use SSL encrypted accounts on the Unistream. Uh, one thing that I, I know that I'm just I'm just going to say this just because in the past couple of weeks I've had this question pop up where this is the solution. Um, Gmail specifically, you have to actually go into your account that you're using and enable less secure applications, or else you can run into some issues with sending uh, an email with Gmail on a UniStream. Uh, how can I use a load cell? Uh, a load cell is going to be an I.O. module that you can either connect to an EXRC1 or the local expansion adapter. Um, that's actually, a, I appreciate you saying that. Um, if, if anybody has a unit on hand currently, specifically a vision unit, if you look anywhere in that controller and see a port that reads EXP, that is not an Ethernet. A lot of people think that because a, a Cat5 cable will fit into that port, um, it's not an Ethernet port. That is for the local expansion uh, adapter cable that you have to plug in the PLC side cable to. Okay, can the user change 
uh, RS-232 and 45 settings, yes. So you actually have the ability to do so um, at the project level, right? Uh, uh, you're going to have a common NIT block again, right? So depending, maybe let's just say if you have multiple devices that the controller can connect to, you can set up um, conditions that trigger another common NIT block that has a different baud rate. You also can uh, adjust settings in info mode. And another thing in info mode that you have the ability to do, especially when it comes to serial communication, uh, very, very valuable, you can monitor the actual COM port and what information is coming in in like a raw form. Can you set the IP address as variable so you can change it as needed? Great question. Um, I don't think, I, I, I know that I didn't mention it. You absolutely can have either a hard-coded IP address or a user-entered IP address. So you have the ability to make that IP address indirect. Uh, and you can do that for um, the IP address, the subnet, and the gateway, which is very nice. So IP connectivity only happens when you know the PLC name. Does that mean the PLC name is working as a password of sorts? Yes. Uh, that is when you're connecting in VisiLogic. If you're trying to connect to a unit with like a protocol, uh, all you do is just point to the IP address of the port that you want to connect to. Yes, so uh, for Modbus TCP, is there a way of um, disconnecting and waiting for a master to reconnect? So your best defense against a socket hanging open is actually um a number of system integers that act as a keep alive right so depending on um the situation if you have a device where you are acting as let's just say a slave or a server uh, and a client is reaching out and making connection to you a keep alive time can be entered into one of these system integers 103 through 106 and after that certain amount of time has passed and no traffic on the port is seen um, that socket closes so that the master can then go and reconnect to it can you send an email to the plc no um, you would send an email uh, out of the plc you can send an sms message to the plc but you have to use our 3g modem kit Uh, are there plans to incorporate SSL encryption? Uh, none that I am aware of, and it has not even been in any talks that I've had in about six years now. So I don't, I don't think so. Um, but again, if it's something that is vital for a large application with larger potential, shoot us an email, and, and we can, we can always revert that to or send that to R&D and see what can be done. So, okay, great question. So for email uh, sending, I need to use socket zero with port 202, uh, 20258 as a master. Uh, no. So um, those are the settings for this example project. Depending on your application, you might have all four sockets in use that do not have the default settings. So you can, you can uh, configure those sockets however you'd like. Uh, with the port numbers that you'd like so long as it's right. So it's kind of one of those cases where um, it's right as long as it works. So you're not limited to sending email on socket zero or with port 2508, 20258. <laughs> Serial ports for vision allow termination. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's via jumper setting. So if you have an RS-45, um, a unit on an RS-45 network and you're an end device, even if you're not an end device, right, termination still has to be set whether it's on or off. You just pop the back cover off, uh, you choose the standard, 232 or 45, and then there's a jumper specifically for termination if it's on or off. Any future protocols such as Profinet uh, or DNP3? Great question. We do have the ability to be a Profibus slave. Um, outside of that, I do not I have not heard anything on uh, either of those. Um, just a quick point on DNP3. Uh, I actually discussed this with the customer this week. Um, 
it may it, it, it may be you actually because the name sounds <laughs> real familiar but uh there are a number of there's actually a number of uh gateways that are out there that convert one protocol to another and i want to say that i did see online a modbus to dnp3 gateway so just uh do a do a quick google search see if there's anything that jumps out um essentially what you need to do is find a common denominator protocol for our controller and the gateway and then use the gateway to push to whatever device you're trying to get to yeah can you pass along your email address for the sample files just shoot it into support i'll see it and i'll uh, send it over to you support at unitronics.com Uh, is there a standard for port forwarding or are all modems different? I mean, port forwarding for the most part uh, is going to be the same concept, uh, even with varying modems, right? You basically just want to make sure that you're directing global traffic to the appropriate local area network device. Um, do I have to make ladder in the EXRC1 or in the PLC? Great question. So you actually, uh, when you have an EXRC1, um, you have to build the communication from EXRC1 to the PLC. So you don't have the ability to just do plug and play type communication like you would with the EXA2X. You actually are building communication from the PLC to the EXRC1. So it makes it a little bit more of a pain. Uh, but again, if you need to expand past eight um, eight expandable I/O mod modules, that's what the EXA2X will give you. Then the EXRC1 is a must. And also, if you are farther than 30 meters, then the EXRC1 is a must. Uh, I don't. It looks like the question is cut off, but something along the lines of 3G anymore uh, yeah so um just real real quick uh you can even google um publish dates for when 3g is just straight up not going to be available anymore right so it's a it's sort of a, a, a tricky case when you need sms capabilities because our 3g kit gives you the ability to use the function blocks to send and receive text messages, um, but you're also going to lose that capability at some point in the near future. So I always point people in the direction of using um, a third-party Ethernet modem, um, just because at that point it's really just going to be from the from a controller standpoint, it's just Ethernet connectivity. The only thing that you lose is the true SMS function blocks. So you would have to revert to um, emails over GPRS or email over Ethernet. Um, you cannot use the SMS function blocks with a third party modem, but I know that there are third, uh, I know that there are like email to SMS gateways that can be used. I've seen those work successfully. I've seen those introduce some issues on the sending side. So, uh, again, it's one of those cases where you got to almost use your best judgment for, uh, what the future holds for connectivity. Uh, you don't have baud rate with Ethernet. Um, baud rate is a limitation on a serial device where you don't necessarily have that limitation um, on an Ethernet network. Uh, is there, do we support MCP protocol? I actually have never heard of that so if you want to shoot maybe shoot that into uh the support line i i or, or the the support inbox i'd be i'd be happy to uh to take a look at that mc mcp i mean i, I don't know if there's a gateway to that or if if it's even possible to do like modbus to to mcp but um we can we can have a discussion on that if you either want to give me a call or just shoot me an email uh ethernet ip great question so we support ethernet Right, and what a lot of people have a confusion of is Ethernet IP. The protocol is not just Ethernet 
TCP IP connectivity, right? Ethernet IP is a flavor of communication or protocol, if you will, um, that is communicated over the physical layer of Ethernet. So uh, the Vision and Samba does not support Ethernet IP. The Unistream does support Ethernet IP. Um, when are you doing a servo seminar with demo code? Uh, we actually have had a motion webinar done recently. If you want the recording of that, um, just, just shoot us an email and we can get you a link. All right, that looks like it's it for questions, guys. Uh, I really appreciate you tuning in uh, to the fourth installment of Locked In Learning. Um, I want everybody to have a great rest of the week, great weekend. Stay safe, stay, stay healthy, uh, stay positive, test negative, shoot us an email with any additional questions and we'd be happy to talk about anything. Uh, check back in two-ish days for the recording of this guy. Uh, and if you want any of those examples or just want to get pointed in the direction of those examples, let me know. Uh, for those of you guys who have tu uh, tuned in to the end, I'll just show you real quick. If you go to help, examples, version 900, project examples, communications, these are where all of these bad boys are going to be. So if you wanted to either use those as like a skeleton for a project you're building or just import the code in. Uh, I'm sorry, export the code and import it into your project. Uh, that's definitely viable too. Uh, but I appreciate you tuning in. Um, if you guys are interested in any upcoming webinars, uh, you can contact the sales department or the marketing team. They will have uh, some more information on that. Thank you and have a great rest of the week.